In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We are a people of joy over life. In October 1939, Hitler signed a brief directive empowering his personal physician and another henchman the power to quote, extending to specific, um, excuse me, extending to specified doctors that those who according to human judgment are incurably ill may be granted after a critical examination of the state of their health a mercy death. And families began to complain that their loved ones who were in institutions, developmentally disabled, mentally disabled, in institutions were dying or they're being notified of deaths without having any previous notification that these people were even ill. Because of the protests of these people, the Nazis began moving these folks to state institutions where this could be done more easily. The SS began transplanting them and taking them before they were euthanized, that is murdered. And a few courageous churchmen, however, spoke up. Friedrich von Bodeschwing uh, was the leader of the Bethel Institute, which housed the developmentally disabled. And he would quickly find homes for Jewish children who needed to be protected from the Nazis and protection from this rash of murder. And von Bodelschwing was a good friend of Hermann Zasse, our great friend of the Missouri Synod, the very Zasse who spoke up. He was the first churchman to publicly speak up against the Nazi Aryan paragraph. And he said, the Lutheran doctrine of original sin damns the purest Aryan person no less than the worst gypsy or half caste. What a courageous thing. It's hard to believe he managed to make it through those years. Roman Catholic Bishop Clemens, uh, August Graf von Galen, preached publicly denouncing the murders which were now being extended to the aged infirm. He said, do you or I have the right to live only as long as we are productive? Then someone has only to order a secret decree that the measures tried out on the mentally ill be extended to the other non-productive people. That it can be used on those incurably ill with lung disease, on those weakened by aging, on those disabled at work, on severely wounded soldiers. Then not a one of us is sure anymore of his life. Woe to humanity. Woe to our German people when the sacred commandment, thou shalt not kill, is not only violated, but when this violation is tolerated and carried out without permission. Von Bodelschring was elected the Reichsbishop the head of the entire kind of forced union of German Protestant churches, only to be forced out by Hitler and replaced by Reichsbishop Müller, who shot himself in the head about the time Hitler did. The British dropped leaflets of Galen's sermon over the towns and villages. Hitler's murderous secret was secret no more. Under public pressure, 21 days after the bishop's sermon, the madmen ordered the carnage to cease. The records show that 70,273 patients had been murdered, though the actual count was probably much higher. Lutheran pastor Ernst Wilm, a former vicar of von Bodelschwing at Bethel, had also dared to protest publicly. He rejoiced that the killing had apparently ended and he thanked God for it in a New Year's Eve sermon. But the rumors continued, and so did the killings. Later he recounted, I was arrested on January 23rd, 1942, and interrogated, basically, only because of this story about the killings of patients. They asked me about little things like why I didn't say Heil Hitler when I began my confirmation class. It was ludicrous. And they said, you're stabbing the army in the back with such stories. I replied, you're stabbing the army in the back when you murder children and sick people behind backs, the backs of men and fathers who were out there fighting. 
I came to the police prison in Bielefeld and sat there until May. Then came the command signed by Heydrich, and with that I came to Dachau and served my time there. And in this death camp, he had marked on his arm the tattoo, prisoner number 30,156. It's amazing he survived. The Nazis called the weak and the needy lives unworthy of life. The secret for us, my friends, in this dark day of living a good news life in a bad news world is knowing that every human being is created in God's own image and is therefore valuable. The secret to a joyous and meaningful life is the realization that because Jesus himself took on human flesh from conception and because Jesus valued every human life, especially those worthless in the eyes of the world, each and every human life is temporally and eternally precious, no matter how young, how old, or how imperfect. The secret to a joyous life worth living is acting on behalf of those who cannot act for themselves. Joy over life jumps off, leaps out of every page of the Bible. It verily bubbles out of Jesus' lips. There are pervasive texts like Genesis 1, the image of God, Exodus 21, where specific provision is made for punishment for those who kill a life in the womb. An ethic of the inherent value of every human life conceived, no matter what its form or malformity. Simply put, for Jesus, there is no life unworthy of living. In fact, the Christ turns the human value system completely on its head to the great joy of the least. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped. Eskiptazen. It's our same word in English. The baby skipped for joy in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of you, your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Eskiptazen en agaliase. Leap for joy. What a remarkable transaction. John the baptizer skips for joy in vitro over the greeting of the mother of my Lord. Two unborns, the Lord himself and his great forerunner, are each acknowledged as such in the womb. The word used by Luke more than any other New Testament writer expresses what is an outburst of joy. In fact, Luke is the evangelist of joy, and he's actually the evangelist of joy over life. Allow me to pass through Luke's gospel briefly this morning with this lens, the preferential option for the least, the last, the unloved, and Jesus' joy over life. A peasant, Elizabeth, rejoiced over the unborn Lord, Luke 1, The unlikely mother of the Lord, Mary, sang her Magnificat. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He has exalted those of humble estate, Luke 1, Elizabeth's friends and family rejoiced with her over her newborn, Luke 1, Zechariah's tongue was loosed and praised after the mute wrote, His name is John. He spoke, blessing God, for he has visited and redeemed his people, Luke 1, Praise and blessings are the sounds that joy makes. At the birth of Christ, the angel announced to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, Luke 2. The whole heavenly host rejoiced over the one who came to bring peace between God and man, Luke 2, 14. Feeble old man Simeon beheld his very life. In, this, in his own arms, in the flesh, and rejoiced, mine eyes have seen your salvation. Let your servant depart in peace, Luke 2, 29. You see, peace is joy at rest. Jesus, a quiet man, a carpenter from Nazareth, suddenly came preaching a message of joy, particularly for the outcast, the weary, the lame, the lives unworthy of life. 
He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, Luke 4, 18. He immediately set upon his path, caring for the sick and the needy, Simon's mother-in-law, Luke 4, 38. The sick and diseased, Luke 4, 40. The paralytic, Luke 5, 25. The lepers, Luke 5, 12. Then Jesus began inviting the dregs of society to be his friends. Like Levi, the tax collector, Luke 5, 27. And he still invites the dregs like you. Even you in the back. <laughs> I asked them before this sermon if I could mention a few of their sins up here publicly, but nobody was forthcoming. Luke tells us that Jesus feasted and rejoiced with them all and thereby honored life as a gift. Luke 5, 34. Jesus, the very ambassador of life, taught that any and every life, any law which compromised and threatened life had to fall. I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm? To save life or destroy it? Luke 6, 9. He made the ambassadors of death furious over his joy for life and for the least, Luke 6. The multitudes came to him, the diseased, the unclean, the, the diseased with unclean spirits, and he healed them. Life so pulsated in and pervaded his life that when they merely touched him, he healed them all, Luke 6, 19. Has there ever been such respect for life? He expressed his gratitude of joy over the oppressed, the least, the worst, the hungry, the sad, the sinner, in beatitude after beatitude. Be merciful to all, even enemies, Luke 6, 31. Christ is the God incarnate, joy in, in the flesh, life sent to redeem life. His joy for life over life tells us who our God is. Be merciful, even as your Father in heaven is merciful, Luke 6, 36. The centurion's daughter, Luke 7, 8. The widow's son, 7, 12. The blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, the poor, all were healed and heard the gospel again and again, Luke 7, 21. The least are the greatest in the kingdom, Luke 7, 46. Jesus ate and drank and enjoyed time with his band of mits, misfits, tax collectors and sinners, and even prostitutes. The good soil is, according to Jesus, the refuse of the world, the despised of the world. The good news knows no genetic preference, Luke 8, 9 and following. The garrison, after so much pain and suffering, joyless and dead while he lived in the cemetery, dragging his chains, was put at rest, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, Luke 8, 35. The poor woman, whose livelihood had been exhausted by hemorrhage, was healed, finally healed in both body and soul after 12 joyless years, Luke 8, 41. Jairus' daughter was raised from death to life, Luke 8, 54. Jesus preached that he would be killed, but on the third day raised, Luke 9, 22. Because he would pass from death to life, he invited his followers on the path to joy, to deny themselves, and to follow him. Whoever loses his life for my sake will gain it, Luke 9, 23. And how did Jesus lose his life? By spending it for others, by sharing the burdens, the sufferings, the joys, the sorrows of the despised. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you is the one who is great. Luke 9, 48. Jesus was exuberant with joy along with the returning 72. Luke 10, over the good news preached and the needy healed. He rejoiced exuberantly in the Holy Spirit, joyfully confessed it a marvel that such things had been revealed to little children, but not the wise, Luke 10. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus taught that life is precious no matter whose life it is, Luke 10, 35. Seventy thousand two hundred and seventy-three disabled individuals murdered by the Nazis. Add six million to that. Six million, 74,273. And then think today of 
53 million. 53 million. I must say there is little joy to be had on a day like today over that news. But my friends, we like Jesus are people of joy over life. We don't go at this problem because we are against sex, because we're prudes, because we're antiquated. We are in this struggle because of joy. Roman law said, foetus pars viscerum matris, the fetus is part of the body of the mother, and therefore she could act accordingly. The New Testament came with a different message, in fact, specifically in Galatians, saying that pharmakeia was forbidden, which was the mixing of potions, often called sorcery, which was actually making abortif abortifacients. The Didache came right away, first century, 120 or so, and condemned abortion. The church condemned infanticide. Why? Because we are people of life. Let the little children come. What shall we do? We shall pray. We'll pray at the tomb of this nation's moral sense until it rises again. We shall pray and weep until it rises again. We shall work. Life is holy and sacred. It's beautiful like this wonderful vestment. And nevertheless, it requires walking shoes to get into the mud. <laughs> and we will love. We will have mercy. We'll have children. And we will fight and struggle as long as this struggle is before us and the Lord Christ will bless count on his blessings in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen, Amen.